Do you ever wonder what it's like to be a millionaire? Well, let me tell you guys, I'm not exactly rolling in cash, but I am a Webtoon millionaire. That's right, multiple of my series have racked up millions of reads across different platforms, such as Webtoon, VoiceMe, Tapas, and more. But what does that actually mean, and how did I even get here? In today's video, we're gonna be diving into how I became a Webtoon millionaire in today's world of digital comics. So if you guys don't know who I am, I'm Brandon Chen. I am a studio owner for a studio called Inspired Productions. We make manga and Webtoon original stories for various platforms. We pretty much take the successful ones and we try and turn them into anime or other things. Now before we get into my story, I do want you to smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm that really helps share more educational content about the anime, manga, and webtoon industry with people who don't know anything about the industry yet. So that'd be very useful for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe if you want to be updated on more stuff that is educational about this industry. Check out my long form stuff. Now let's get into my story. Rewinding a little bit, how did I get into manga, webtoon, anime stuff? So it all started when I saw my first pair of boobs. <laughs> I'm not even joking. When I was in like kindergarten, my mom got me my first manga, which was Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball, at the time, the first chapter, you do see boobs. And I was a child and I was like, wow, boobs, this is my awakening. <laughs> but yeah, I got infatuated with the world of Dragon Ball, the characters, and obviously Bulma. I was just like, wow, Bulma, you're amazing. That was what got me into manga. And then I started reading other series that were kind of similar, but kind of not. I got into Rama one half, which was also about boobs and butts, but a romance action fantasy. But I also got into uh, into Naruto, Bleach, One Piece, those kinds of manga. And that all started with Dragon Ball. And uh, what made me want to create that stories was reading these stories, where I would read these and be like, wow, I really want to draw and create stories one day when I'm like 10 years old, seven, 10 years old, whatever. And so I'm drawing manga in my free time when I get home from school. And then I'm going on the playgrounds and trying to sell them to kids. My little mini Shonen Jump pack if you guys don't know what Shonen Jump is, it's obviously like a like a magazine of manga. And basically what I would do is I would I would draw these manga, I would print them out, I would scan them, print out multiple copies, staple them like they're books, really crappy books. And then I would bring them to the kids on the playground and try to sell them for quarters. I'm from Connecticut, so we got bullied for liking anime. So no one would buy in. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, was, it was something that I used to do because I was so passionate about the manga and anime type industry. Then I got into watching anime because of Toonami on Cartoon Network. And so, you know, I was watching the manga that I was reading on TV, which is very exciting. Naruto, Bleach, One Piece, Inuyasha, that kind of stuff. You know, I kept doing this until eventually I realized that I'm not getting that much better at writing and drawing. When I was around 14 years old, I was like, I'm improving both these things at a very mediocre pace. I need to get better faster, right? If I want to make this my thing. So I decided to flip a coin. Um, I took a quarter and uh, flipped it. Heads, I'm a writer. Tails, I'm an artist for the rest of my life. Landed on heads and that is what I've become. This is the man I, that you see today before you. Not an artist, just a writer. Deleted my art Instagram, all that kind of stuff and went all in on writing. And so uh, my story is really about how I didn't think it was possible. I didn't think it was possible to make it in the manga industry from the United States after years of being bullied for liking anime and all that stuff. I was like, how am I going to break into entertainment and storytelling? And it's through novels. I was also a big reader of American novels. Um, and so I was like, yeah, let me just move into the novel space with an anime type spin because that's what I love. And so I was starting to do that. I was, I think I was publishing at the same time as the beginning after the end. Uh, I was like a total, I was like a kid. Yeah, I was publishing and I remember seeing his book when he was first publishing too. But uh, yeah, I wrote for a couple years, my first novel, put it out when I was 17, published Age of Darkness, don't read it, it's on Amazon. If you, I mean, you can read it. I was 14 when I wrote that. But I published when I was 17. Kept publishing every year after that novels until I realized that that one day you don't have to be an artist to produce visual projects. When I was younger, I thought that I have to do everything and that mangaka are all doing this by themselves, which some of them are, but like there's usually a team behind it. And sometimes there's writer artist duos, such as the creator of Death Note. And when I saw Death Note, I was like, hey, this is possible for a writer to be involved in the manga medium. That's crazy. And so I got my first gig doing actually American comics, not manga. I and mean, that's because American comics are popular in, the, in, in America. America, but manga was not yet super popular, very niche 
huge thing at the time. And so I learned how to do visual storytelling through working in the American comics industry, eventually shifted over into manga where I was like, this is what I really want to do. I don't really read American comics, if I'm being honest. Like I only read manga. I only consume like Asian storytelling from the from the comic space, if I'm being honest. And so uh, I went all in on manga, was uh, also a finance bro at the same time. So I would clock in for my nine to nine <laughs> job. And then I would work until like midnight or something doing my, my manga projects and eventually got my big break when I entered Shonen Jump Tezuka, went viral for my submission and got a serialization deal on a project called God Game, which is on Voice Me, you can read it. And from God Game, got another serialization deal from, you know, another platform called Webtoon, which then gave me the project Just a Goblin. And, you know, both these projects have helped propel my career in a really meaningful way. And now, and those are the ones that obviously have the millions and millions of, of reads that I was talk telling you guys about at the beginning of the video. So that's the journey of how I started when I was like in kindergarten and like a freaking baby to now today where I'm serializing the same stories that the same types of stories that I would have read as a kid and now I'm 27 years old and this is what I do for a living which is kind of crazy. So what does it mean though to have these millions of reads? Like what does that mean? Let's just be real for a second. Those numbers don't really mean anything. They are a big confidence boost to me. You know personally there's like wow you have millions of reads like great that's super cool but they're you know at the end of the day they're just numbers right they're just numbers. But what's really cool about having people that read your project regardless of how many people there are is definitely the community. So like on a lot of these like digital comics platforms you can kind of see like the comments people talking about your project people arguing about each other some people are upset with me for do making certain narrative decisions they don't know it by the way but they secretly like my narrative decision yeah you would they secretly like it what bro what are you talking about man that's a video for another time though. My philosophy is that when you kill off a character to progress a story in a narrative way, people are gonna be upset, obviously, but that spur of emotion is really what helps make the story a lot more engaging. But yeah, going back to what I was talking about earlier, it's definitely the community that you build around your project and that is the most interesting and the most fun. Like seeing people talk about your work, seeing people be passionate about your work, seeing people raw even like your work, like fan fictions and stuff like that or fan art, I mean, it's an amazing feeling. And then even meeting people in the wild, like in real life, people come up to me sometimes and they're like, you're the guy who did God Gamer or just a goblin or whatever and I'm like how the hell do you recognize my face like you just read the series right maybe they see these videos I don't know so it's not just about the reads it's about the impact that you have as a creator on the people that are reading your project because the projects that I do sure they're meant to entertain for sure a lot of it is also meant to deliver some sort of message that I personally have as part of my core philosophies about life and I try to instill that within my stories right you know and I think that that is the most fulfilling part you know the whole funny thing that I said at the beginning about being a millionaire I think it's definitely really when you're doing storytelling you never get into this business because of the money and, uh, and I'll be honest you can make money in this industry but you never get into it because of the money because a lot of people fail a lot of people failed most of my life spent failing right it's only in the last like five years that things have really taken off for me and the part that makes me feel so rich right the millionaire metaphor that I was talking about is the impact that you have on other people it's seeing the community, it's meeting the fans, it's seeing your work not only be accepted by fans, but also be accepted by other professionals. As in like, hey, we're getting an anime adaptation. Hey, like people are interested in bringing it to print. Hey, people are interested in working with me on other projects, etc. That is also like another thing where it's like, wow, your life feels so rich. You know what I mean? And obviously the storytelling thing has also helped me be able to live the life that I want. I can work on my own hours. I can travel. I can work remotely. I don't travel too much because it actually, if I travel, it makes my stomach hurt. <laughs> so I don't do it too much, but I can theoretically do it whenever I want, which is kind of cool. But uh, I think the key core thing about all this is definitely a message of, hey guys, if you're a creator, don't be only chasing the millions and millions of numbers. At the end of the day, it's about much more than just like, hey, a million reads on a platform. It's about what that number represents. It's about the community, right? And the people that that are reading your stories. It's about the readers and the many people that believe in your story, if that makes sense. Hopefully that message resonates with you guys. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for listening to my story. And if you're watching this video this far, I'm assuming that you're one of 
the people that that is out here supporting my journey and hopefully you're on a journey of your own which is very exciting so yeah if you enjoyed this peek behind the webtoon panels uh, make sure to drop a like for the youtube algorithm again subscribe comment the special word for today it's going to be arrow if you made it this far into the video and hopefully you guys always remember that it's not all about the numbers or even how many people are reading your story it's about the impact that you're leaving on the readers always think about that as if you're a creator and hopefully you can be a creator that feels rich as well thanks so much see you guys on next week's video peace do you ever wonder what it's like to be in the middle hell lock in hey everyone do you guys ever